Thank you for joining this episode of UAB Medicine's post-COVID Lunch and Learn series. Today, Dr. Amanda Carty, Assistant Professor in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology will be presenting, Did COVID Kick You in the Gut? Three Common GI Symptoms and When to be Seen. Please submit your questions in the Q&A, and if time allows at the end of today's presentation, Dr. Carty will try and answer as many questions as possible. For those of you new to Zoom, you will find the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. I will pass this over to Dr. Carty. Dr. Carty? Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Laura. I just wanted to give a reminder here that this is one of our last episodes in the post-COVID webinar series, but don't miss our next one, which is our last with Dr. Cohen in the post-COVID syndrome and your primary care doctor. Now, before we talk about gastrointestinal symptoms post-COVID, I wanted to go over some general concepts about coronavirus. As you all may know, coronavirus is actually a whole group of viruses that can infect mammals and birds. Coronaviruses are not new. They actually cause about 15% of the common winter colds. We call them coronavirus because when we look at them underneath a microscope, they look like a crown. COVID-19 is the name for the variation that caused the pandemic, SARS-CoV-2-2019. Now, I'm sure that you all have heard that patients can have symptoms for long periods of time after COVID, which is what we've been addressing in this webinar series on post-COVID. I wanted to go over the three different phases of symptoms after COVID-19 infection. First, we have acute COVID, in which symptoms last up to four weeks after the illness starts. Then in the middle here, we have ongoing symptomatic COVID-19 infection. During this time period, patients can have symptoms that last anywhere from four to 12 weeks after the illness starts. And what our focus will be on today is post-COVID-19, where symptoms develop anywhere during or after COVID-19 that continue beyond 12 weeks after the illness starts. And it's not explained by other conditions or diagnoses. Now let's talk about gastrointestinal post-COVID symptoms. Here's what we'll do today. Review the connection between GI symptoms and COVID-19. Discuss three common GI symptoms post-COVID. Distinguish which patients need to come in to see a GI doctor and how to manage symptoms. Let's start off by talking about infections and your gut. Over here on the right, you see a picture of your gastrointestinal symptom, system. And you'll see that actually multiple organs make up your gut. These organs all work together to perform three jobs. One, break down food into small particles. Two, absorb vitamins, minerals, fats, carbohydrates, and protein. And number three, remove toxins and waste. Infections can affect your gut, particularly your esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and colon. On occasion, infections might affect multiple or several organs. Now we all know that infections can cause gastrointestinal or gut symptoms. Symptoms during an infection might include heartburn, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, or bleeding. And these infections can be caused by bacteria, parasites, and viruses like COVID-19. Symptoms can continue even after the infection is treated or cleared. In GI, we have a specific term for this. This is called post-infectious heartburn, diarrhea, constipation, gastroparesis or lazy stomach, or irritable bowel syndrome, depending on the types of symptoms that you're experiencing. So we are used to GI patients having symptoms after infections, even infections that are not COVID-19. Here's what we know about post-infectious symptoms. People who had the same infection can have different symptoms. Some might have nausea, others might have diarrhea. And these symptoms can start months after recovery from infection. Oftentimes these symptoms are linked to the nerves that are causing the symptoms. And we call this hypersensitivity. Everyone wants to know, when will I get better? 
What we do know about recovery is that it's variable from person to person. Oftentimes, we see gradual improvement over months to years, and oftentimes complete resolution of symptoms. Now that we've talked about post-infectious symptoms and conditions in GI in general, we'll be talking a little bit more about the symptoms that we see after COVID-19. One of the most common symptoms I see in patients in my clinic is heartburn. Now, I'd like to take a little bit of time and talk about what is heartburn. Some of you might think this is kind of a silly question, but the reason I wanna focus on this is that if you take a group of 10 people who have heartburn, they might all describe it in a slightly different way. So let's go through each of them here. People may use different words to describe heartburn, such as burning sensation in the back of their throat, the feeling of fluid coming up to the back of their throat, coughing after eating, burning sensation in their chest, or a burning sensation just below the rib cage or heart. Oftentimes we think of heartburn as occurring after eating, which is commonly the case. So oftentimes these symptoms are occurring during the day. But other times patients tell us that they wake up first thing in the morning and have heartburn or wake up in the middle of the night with these symptoms. So you might be wondering, why is this happening? Well, let's take a good look at the esophagus and the stomach. So over here on the left upper picture, you'll see that this is the esophagus where my mouse pointer is, and this is the stomach. The blue arrow shows the lower esophageal sphincter, which is basically the door between the esophagus and the stomach. This door should be closed after eating. But what you'll see in heartburn is over here on the right, this door between the esophagus and the stomach stays open and the teal fluid, which is acid, goes up from the stomach and into the esophagus as indicated by the white arrows. This cause causes an irritation of the lining of the esophagus, leading to pain and discomfort. Aside from this, sometimes the stomach can make more acid than it usually does, which can also lead to heartburn. And when these two things resolve, Sometimes the nerves of the esophagus continue to send messages about pain and heartburn merely out of habit. So what can we do about heartburn? Well, there's two main types of categories that we think of. The first are lifestyle changes and the second are medications. So lifestyle changes, adjusting your diet, easier said than done. But oftentimes patients will tell us that they notice certain foods worsen their symptoms like caffeine, chocolate, and spicy foods. If you're noticing this, try to avoid these foods. You may also need to change your bedtime routine. Try to eat at least three hours before you go to bed at night or elevate the head of the bed. This helps prevent the acid from going through the open door between the stomach and the esophagus. If these things aren't helping, you may need to try some over-the-counter medications like Tums, Prilosec or Pepsid, these are safe to try over the counter. And if your symptoms are ongoing for weeks or even months, you may need a prescription medication to manage these symptoms. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering, when should I see a doctor? Well, in the medical field, we talk about red flag symptoms. These are symptoms that are more serious and indicate that you might need tests because something else is going on. So if you're having weight loss, especially if you're not trying to lose weight, difficulty swallowing or the sensation that food is getting stuck in your food pipe, pain with swallowing, vomiting, heartburn that wakes you up in the middle of the night, over-the-counter medications not helping, or you're 60 years old or older, it's important that you come in to see your doctor and talk about these symptoms and determine the next best step. Now let's move on to common symptom number two, nausea. Why does nausea happen? Well, there's actually many different reasons and we will not cover all of them today, just a few. Inflammation in the stomach can lead to nausea as well as stomach ulcers. The stomach can also not empty food at the rate it should, which is called gastroparesis or a lazy stomach. This can lead to nausea. And just like in heartburn, Sometimes the nerves of the stomach can continue to send nausea signals just out of habit, even when the things above are no longer happening. 
Of course, there are also many reasons outside the gut that a person might have nausea, like vertigo or motion sickness, and we will not be covering these today. How do we treat nausea? Again, we have some simple lifestyle changes and medications that can help. Some of you may have heard of the BRAT diet. Basically, this is eating bland food like bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. And really, this is more of a short-term fix to help prevent nausea. Only a couple days. You should not be following a diet like this for months at a time. Natural products like ginger, including ginger ale, and peppermint and peppermint teas might also help soothe the lining of the stomach, helping prevent nausea. If you're continuing to have nausea for days or weeks at a time, it may be necessary to take a medication that stops nausea when it starts. Some of these you may have heard before, Zofran or Phenagrin. And if these aren't helping, then you may need a medication that prevents the nausea from happening in the first place. Some of these medications include Zofran and Phenagrin, but taken scheduled or prescription medications. Again, we have some red flag symptoms when people are experiencing nausea that should indicate that you should, you should meet with a doctor and talk with them about your symptoms. So if you're having any of these symptoms, come in and talk to us. Nausea every day that's going on for weeks, vomiting multiple times a week, feeling full easily and eating less, weight loss, especially if you're not trying to lose weight, bleeding or vomiting blood, and nausea that keeps you from doing your daily activities. Come in and see us so that we can figure out what additional tests you might need and try to help make your symptoms uh, more manageable. Okay, common symptom number three, diarrhea. I guess I should have given a disclaimer at the beginning here that this is the lunch hour and we might be talking about things like bowel habits and bowel movements. Um, I'm sorry for not doing that, but here's your warning now. This is what I talk about all day, so I'm used to talking about it even over the lunch hour. Here's a formal definition of diarrhea, more than seven ounces of stool a day. Now, I am not encouraging you all to go out and measure your stool every day. In fact, we have practical definitions instead that might be easier to follow. So if you're having three or more stools a day or have a change in your stool consistency, which we'll talk about in a bit, this is considered diarrhea. The Bristol stool form is a measure of stool consistency, and you'll see it pictured here on the right. So in the middle, we have type three and type four consistency, which is considered normal. Stools that are more hard or lumpy, such as type one or type two, are consistent with constipation. And type five, six, and seven consistency, soft to watery, equal diarrhea. So why does diarrhea happen? Again, just like these other symptoms we've talked about, there's several different reasons. And here's why it might happen after COVID-19. First of all, the small intestine may not be able to absorb food or the food components very well. The best example I have of this is lactose intolerance. You may know someone who has this. Folks who have lactose intolerance are not able to absorb the sugar lactose, which is found in dairy products like milk. So if someone has lactose intolerance and they drink milk, their body isn't able to absorb it. And to eliminate that from the body, the body has diarrhea. Number two, inflammation in the small intestine or colon may lead to diarrhea. Lastly, the small intestine or colon may move too quickly. Sometimes we might refer to this as a spastic colon. And this is really a result of the nerves of the small intestine and the colon. The nerves of the gut control the speed at which these organs move, resulting in diarrhea. How do we treat it? Again, we have some lifestyle changes and medications that can help. Again, a bland diet called the BRAT diet may help with symptoms for several days, but this is not something that should be followed for months uh, on end to help treat your symptoms. If you're concerned that you may develop dehydration or you've developed some mild dehydration because of the diarrhea, drinks like Pedialyte and Gatorade may help as well. Medications over the counter that stop diarrhea once it starts include Imodium, 
And if you're needing this for more than several weeks, you need to come in and see a doctor to see what else could be going on and what other options we have as far as treatment. Sometimes prescription medications in addition to Imodium are necessary. Last but not least, we have our red flag symptoms for diarrhea. So if you're having any of these symptoms, we want you to come in and see us so we can figure out what kind of testing you need and what kind of symptom management we have to help with your symptoms. If you're having blood in your stool, diarrhea that wakes you up in the middle of the night, weight loss, particularly if you're not trying to lose weight, a fever, which is a temperature over 102 degrees Fahrenheit, or if you're anemic or have low blood counts, please come in and see us. What your doctor will do when you come into the office is try to determine if your symptoms are one, from a condition other than COVID-19, two, from a condition you already had before COVID, but was made worse by COVID infection, or three, if your symptoms are consistent with post-COVID syndrome. To really answer these questions, your doctor will ask you a lot of questions. They'll ask about your symptoms before, during, and after COVID-19 infection, review your medications with you to ensure they are not contributing to your symptoms, ask about other health conditions that you have, or ask about GI conditions that run in the family, such as celiac disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and colon cancer. While you're there, they'll also do a physical exam. Between the questions that they ask you and the physical exam, they may decide that you need additional tests. That might include blood tests to look for markers of inflammation, vitamin deficiency, or other health conditions. They might also decide that you need a procedure called an upper endoscopy or EGD. There's a picture of this on the right you would come into our procedure unit and receive some sedation. And once sleepy, we would pass a scope with a camera at the tip down your esophagus, into your stomach, and into your intestine. We may even need to take biopsies to make sure that you don't have inflammation or an infection there. Your doctor might also decide that you need to have a colonoscopy performed. To do this, you would need to take a bowel prep to empty out your bowels before coming into the procedure unit. You would receive some sedation and we would put the scope into your colon, take a look at the lining and possibly take biopsies. Aside from this, sometimes we do CT, CAT scans or MRI scans of the abdomen. It's important to keep in mind that these tests may all be negative, even if you're having symptoms. This is incredibly common in GI, even if you're not coming in for a symptom after COVID-19 infection. This is because we have a very limited number of tests that exclude serious conditions, cancer, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, and severe infections. The diagnosis of your symptoms and condition is based on a combination of your history. So those answers that you gave the doctor about the questions they had about your symptoms and the tests. Oftentimes in GI, we have multiple treatments available, which is great news. The downside to that is that sometimes it takes a little bit of trial and error to determine which medication and dose works best to manage your symptoms. Okay, so we've covered a lot today, so I hope you can at least take away these key points. GI symptoms are common after having an infection, including COVID-19 infection. And oftentimes, the most common symptoms I'm seeing in patients after COVID-19 infection include heartburn, nausea, and diarrhea. Why and how these symptoms occur after COVID are not known at this time. See a doctor for red flag symptoms that we discussed. Losing weight, especially when you're not trying, blood in your stool, vomiting up blood, symptoms that occur at night. Because we need to make sure there's not another cause of your symptoms besides COVID-19 infection. And remember, we have a toolkit in GI to manage these post-infectious symptoms. That is all I have for us today, Laura. 
I just wanted to give everyone a reminder once again that our last episode is next week by Dr. Cohen, and he'll be talking about post-COVID syndrome and your primary care doctor. Thank you, Dr. Cardi. We do have a few questions, if you have a minute. Um, Absolutely. So um, do you think any particular diets would be helpful for any of our patients? There are some questions about autoimmune diets, paleo diets. I'm sure you've heard of quite a few. Oh, Laura, that is such a great question. I have to say that this is probably one of the most common questions I get asked in clinic and not just from my post-COVID patients. Um, I wish we had more information and data about what diet is best for GI symptoms in general and post-COVID. Unfortunately, at this time, we really don't have um, a good understanding of which foods may help or harm these symptoms even more. So I think the most important thing when it comes to a diet is to make sure that you're eating a well-balanced, nutritious meal. So you're eating plenty of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and getting protein to make sure that you can recover from this infection. Okay, the next question is, have you seen patients who have new reflux symptoms and weight gain since having COVID? Absolutely. So I am seeing quite a few patients have um, heartburn and reflux symptoms after COVID-19. And I have to say, I wasn't necessarily expecting this when I first started seeing post-COVID patients. I thought I would see more patients with nausea and diarrhea, but um, definitely we're seeing a lot of patients with heartburn that's new and onset, or if they've had it before and they're not able to control it with the medications anymore. We are seeing some patients with weight gain as well, um, in addition to patients with weight loss. And again, I'm not really sure you know, why that's the case. And I think as we see more and more patients, hopefully we can gain more experience and give the insight back to you about what's causing these things and what we can do about them. Sure. And the last question is there's a patient who's experiencing some bowel problems and they're wondering if they could be related to their three week stay in the hospital with COVID-19. Yeah, that is such a great question too. You know, one of the things that we notice is that just even being in the hospital for a time can kind of alter how your gut works. Some people will notice that they're not as active in the hospital and they have more trouble with constipation afterwards. So I would say if you've had COVID-19 infection, um, whether or not you've been in the hospital, good chance that your gastrointestinal symptoms could be from that infection. And I'm happy to see you so that we can get you back on track. Great, so we have no further questions. So we'll end today's Lunch and Learn. Thank you all for joining us. We hope this information has been helpful and informative. To, re um, to register for other post-COVID Lunch and Learns, please visit uabmedicine.org forward slash post-COVID. Thank you, Dr. Carty. Thank you.